our next uh, panel, and the focus is on museums. And the question is, how can museums activate the past in our present? So encouraging better representation, seeking diversity, and, um, and, and diversity also of ideas when curating, and looking out for new models to challenge the status quo, departing from traditional, traditional ideas, um, and perhaps you know, away from um, Eurocentric attitudes of interpreting history. So let's all welcome Alexandra, please, from the Guggenheim. Ah, Mohammed, thank you for being here safe. Alexandra, good to have you again on the floor. You go over there. Okay. I'm all set. Thank You're you. You're all set, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. So, um, uh, thank you. Uh, Adinan, Antonia, Wanda, and Shazia. So thank you very, very much. It is an enormous honor to be here to represent the Guggenheim and to really celebrate these extraordinary three days with so many brilliant minds gathered from around the world. So the, the title of this polemic that we're here to discuss today is how can museums and I'm really talking about contemporary art museums, how can we activate the past in our present? And I want to remind all of you of a very provocative idea that our panelist uh, Emeka uh, Ogbo put forward yesterday in uh, Troy Terrian's panel about how can museums embrace the digital age. And under the sort of you know, uh, concept of cultural responsibility and new technology, which is the theme of this summit, um, he asked us, how can we preserve works from the past that were taken away, usually by aggressive colonial regimes, from their local contexts? In his case, he's speaking of Africa. And how can we restore their power and meaning to societies and communities who are seeking connection now to their historical culture but don't have access because these objects are locked in the basement of the Berlin Museum or behind uh, very heavy glass vitrines in the British Museum or other museums around the world. So he's proposed to us, and you're going to hear more about this because we're going to propose it as an actionable outcome for the summit, that we should create a VR museum. I'm saying it should be curated by artists, and he should do the soundtrack. Um, mm -hmm. uh, where these, uh, we could create a VR museum where these objects could be shared and could be activated. And uh, in this uh, period of time, before the inevitable reparation takes place, people in the communities, people in Africa, in the villages where he grew up in Nigeria, could actually activate their own past through objects that are no longer familiar to them. So what interests me is not only Emeka's political passion, that of course is tied to the larger discussion around reparation, that many of you in the room, especially those here uh, through the auspices of UNESCO, have been fighting for and actually enacting over the last 30 years. But what interests me is that as a contemporary artist, he is willing himself to transport himself to the intelligence housed in objects that embody a whole sensorium and knowledge system from an era other than his own or other than our own here right now. So we all know that the Eurocentric views of history of modern art have undergone a radical, enormous, gigantic shift over the last 30 years. And many of the people in this room and many of my colleagues, and I include Reem Fada, I include Uta Mehta Bauer, I include Apinan Poshananda, and many others from the museum uh, world who are here, we have all sort of been fighting um, to expand, interrupt, interrogate, really mess up. Um, the entrenched narratives of modern art as we inherited them through the uh, 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 
the, the, the great museums of modern art that were first established in the centers, putative centers of modern art, let's say in New York or Paris. We have all been presenting exhibitions and building collections that let's say encompass a wider geography of ideas. And I can just put a little plug into the future Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, and that very idea is the curatorial premise of the museum that will be opening in some years. But one of the most enduring systems, enduring problems of modernism itself is the teleological concept of time. This rigid periodization of history as it's displayed in our museums that makes mixing up temporalities a curatorial taboo. Even though many artists, in fact, I don't know a single artist who works in such a strict periodization, strict concept of time. Artists are working in all times, in all temporalities, drawing from all sources, every day of their creative lives. So why, as curators and as museums and as academies, are we restricted to what I call the tyranny of the present in our display culture? So I work in a contemporary museum that was founded on the principle of the spiritual in abstract art. And our spiritual founder was the Russian-born artist Vasily Kandinsky, who drew as much from 14th century Tibetan Buddhism, he was a theosophist, as he did from contemporary scientific ideas about the effect of music on the brain. But increasingly, this eclecticism that inspired high modernism, we could say, in modern art has been sanitized away. And I often wonder, and this is the question to my distinguished panelists, has contemporary art become an orthodoxy? And if Let's it has, just say yes. the answer is <laughs> yes. Done. No, I'm just yes. kidding. So <laughs> assuming it has, um, how can we break down or get around these habits, these hang-ups, um, of period categorization to activate the past in our galleries? And how can museums accept, and this is where I'm gonna push all of you, it's not just about bringing an object from the past and putting it side by side. I'm not interested in a one-to-one. -one. I'm interested in how these objects from the past or ideas or philosophies or positions, spirituality, if you will, are really radical agents. How can temporality be a radical agent? How can it help us deconstruct this ongoing monolith or ongoing legacies of the modern Western world? So with that, I wanna introduce my distinguished uh, colleagues, and I thank you for all the discussions we've been having over the last several months. Uh, and not in order of discussion, but Wanda Nanibush, who is the uh, Curator of Indigenous Art at the Art Gallery of Ontario, Apinam Poshananda, who is Artistic <laughs> Director of the Bangkok Art Biennial, and is single-handedly created and forged the discourse of contemporary art from Southeast Asia on a global stage. Um, Antonia Carver, who many of you in the region know well, is the director of the Art Jamil in Dubai uh, and has been active in the region as a scholar and curator for many, many years. And my dear friend Shazia Sikander, who is a Pakistani-born artist who lives and works in New York. So um, Wanda, I'm going to start with you. Um, in our discussions, you said, well, the answer is just to throw out chronology altogether and throw out area studies while we're at it. So <laughs> what do you mean by that? Um, okay, well, I have to do a bit of an indigenous protocol. So Wanda Nanabush, Nadijana Kaz, uh, Mayan Gen Dodem, Chimna Singh, Donjaba. Um, I am, and I just said who I am, that I'm Wolf Clan. I come from Chimna Singh. And um, I want to thank uh, the people of Abu Dhabi for having me in your territory. And I want to thank the Guggenheim for inviting me here today. And I love sitting here with you beautiful humans. <laughs> and all of you beautiful humans for listening. Um, I think uh, Anishinaabe is my nation. And it means a spontaneous one. And then we have our word for God is um, the great mystery. 
So we are the spontaneous ones who believe in the great mystery, which fundamentally places us in a humble position in relation to creation, um, but also uh, it puts us in relation to um, all the things that are necessary for us to survive. So the Earth, our first mother, we call her. None of us would be here without her. Um, all the insects, the winged beings, the crawling ones, um, we are in relation to them. So human is not the center of the universe in our world. And I think um, it's something that, it's a thought we should bring into the art world. Uh, possibly, mm -hmm. we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I'm going to talk about today um, in relation to museums is this notion of time. So as an indigenous person, a first person, first peoples, first nation, um, we were supposed to die off a long time ago when colonization happened and civilizations happened. Um, but, you know, too much of the chagrin of, of, you know, the colonizers, we're still here. So it produces like a problematic of time. It's not chagrin, necessarily. <laughs> Well, we'll see. Um, <laughs> um, but it does produce a problematic of time where um, you are only good and pure and perfect in the past, in your authentic, original yeah. past culture. So mm -hmm. everything after that, after contact, is all pollution and, and um, yeah. inauthenticity. Yeah. So I think um, I start from thinking from the future. So I don't think from the present, I think from the future. And I think from the edges of things, so always the marginal, the oppressed, the excluded. If you sit inside of there and you make that the center, then you're, you're thinking from a future where that oppression won't exist anymore, mm -hmm. maybe beyond colonialism. I can't even imagine it. It's still been 500 years and we're still in it, but you know, we can hope and dream. Um, but I think part of that is, um, is throwing out chronology is about the fact that whenever there is a chronology made, it always centers on somebody else's history. Mm -hmm. So another nation's history or a global history that still sort of centers Western modernism or mm -hmm. whatever. So mm -hmm. in our museum, um, my tactic was to center indigenous contemporary art Mm -hmm. and then place everything else in relation to it. Mm -hmm. um, Canadian art is placed in relation to indigenous art. So we let mm -hmm. the artists and the mm -hmm. artwork tell us what it's saying. Mm -hmm. um, and let those questions and thoughts and philosophies and histories that come from those artists' work uh, decide what the conversation is. So for example, uh, we have... Um, so it means that 18th century Canadian art is placed right upside a 1987, you know, protest dress that was worn in a performance that is like half Victorian gown, and then on the back is a bustle that's like a beaver dam, <laughs> and in the beaver dam is caught all the like detritus of the, you know, royals and their like little teacups and spoons that we like to collect. Um, so these things are placed in relation to like 18th century portraiture. Uh, mm -hmm. of beautiful white women. So it's like a way of uh, propping open mm -hmm. new conversations, new questions, mm -hmm. just through um, allowing the artwork to speak for itself. Another, mm -hmm. I'll use one more example before um, I, you go on. Uh, we have a thematic around origins. And this is like a, a place where xenophobia and lots of problematics can arise. So we chose... Um, an artist, Norval Morriso, who's an Anishinaabe artist. Our museum is on Anishinaabe land, so we want to acknowledge that. Um, he is also the first artist to take our uh, spiritual culture um, and put it in paint. And the elders were really upset, and they were like, this is sacrilegious, we don't want people looking at it this way, this is not how it's been done. And he said, um, colonization has happened, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. And he's like, there are going to be lost ones who are going to come back to, to this through my paintings. Mm -hmm. And he's like, and the way that I use color will heal our people from the trauma of colonization. Um, eventually, he just did it anyway, right? <laughs> uh, eventually, the elders came around and they really appreciated it. 
So we place that in the origins room, his two paintings, one of Mother Earth, because that's an origin for us all. Mm -hmm. And the other one is a migration story, because Toronto is 51% new Canadian. So Canada mm -hmm. isn't white, even though it thinks it is. It's no mm -hmm. longer a British colony. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really important to think about the fact that all these people have migrated from all over, whether you know positively or through lots of pain and hardship. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to connect our mm -hmm. migration stories to other mm -hmm. migration stories as a point of mm -hmm. connection. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. So, <laughs> Apina, and I'd, I'd like to turn to you. You have been a curator, I would also call a kind of activist curator, forging this um, not only art history but art practice, curatorial practice, strongly in the region but always in a global context. And you are um, curating primarily uh, from Thailand and with Thai artists. The first show that I saw of yours that was, you know, imprinted in all of our minds is Traditions Tensions that was presented at the Asia Society in New York and traveled ar around um, uh, Asia, actually, in 96. 96, yeah. yeah. Um, so just in that title, Traditions Tensions, mm -hmm. you are implying a lot. So a lot of the artists you're working with in, in the Thai context are specifically referring to Buddhist ideas, or Buddhist practices, or Buddhist motifs. How have you curated that without um, uh, falling into the problem or the trap of Orientalism? Yeah, um, <laughs> in the 90s, and still now, I think uh, we're still struggling with, with the straitjacketing and the pigeonholing of uh, what I call pale white, sip upper lip discourse of curatorship. <laughs> So in that way, guilty. the challenge, <laughs> the challenge that we propose is that, uh, like what Wanda said, the chronology of art from another region altogether must be presented to the audience in New York in, in case of traditions tensions, and the reaction was was quite negative, you know, to begin with because they they couldn't they couldn't understand they couldn't accept you know why these artists uh, are showing in New York, and these are the names that I think they are world renowned now like. Uh, Nalini Malini, Monten Budma, Arayara, these are the names that were totally unknown. Names became problematic because even pronouncing them or writing about them, let alone trying to understand what's their faith and what's their belief. But these artists refer to traditions, meaning that uh, they look back to the museums. And we, we, we come back to the museums again, where mm -hmm. it's, it's a temple whereby uh, it's produced through uh, Eurocentric discourse. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, in Thailand, we have to go through uh, Joe Sedes and John Bosseye, the way they put the discourse in the Southeast Asian ancient art. Mm -hmm. But these artists refer and pick up ideas. You know, they have, like you said, the yeah. ability to skip, borrow, yeah. uh, do anything to it. And a lot of them uh, work in the storage of museums. This is the most exciting place, the storage of museums. Not outside, where the museums are placed, uh, the objects are placed in vitrines, in pedestals, and they're totally out of context. You, you, you don't see it in the way that the sac sacred images are, are seen in the original context. So in this way, the artists were able to, you know, freely express themselves. So, but I think we feel that we have to treat them as artists, not, not particularly artists from a particular you know, country. Mm -hmm. So in this way, we have to also present them mm -hmm. that these are the names of the artists that should be recognized in mm -hmm. contemporary curatorship, especially in education. Mm -hmm. Because art, artistry in contemporary art in Africa, Asia, or elsewhere w was very much lacking. Mm -hmm. So in this way, like <coughs> chronology, we have to also, uh, you know, clean out and, and really interject, whereby uh, we have to uh, study the history of these artists. And I give, I give credit, you know, in the 90s to, to Australians, to Japanese, who were, uh, you know, in the forefront of trying to create this uh, discourse and spaces. Because mm -hmm. in the 90s, as you see, that many Biennales were appearing, whether in Japan, in Australia, and these became new arenas whereby the artists could have space of their own to represent their own ideas, their own contextuality, and hence it's like a slow process. But I think we've, we've come far, yeah. uh, and it's a very exciting time. 
So I'd like to circle back and also ask you in a moment how technology can help us do that too. But uh, Antonia, I think that museums in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the West, including my own, can learn a lot from museums coming online, opening up in regions outside Europe and America. And tomorrow we're going to be hearing from uh, Suhanya Rafael of M Plus and Aaron Sito opening a museum in Jakarta. And, and these are contemporary art museums like Art Jamil. But you are starting from a radically different context. And some of these assumptions that Apinan and I, coming from a different generation, have had to work through and fight through by making these presentations in essentially, you know, um, uh, Western art institutions. W what can we learn? Or can you tell us a little bit about Art Jamil and what the, what the context of presenting contemporary art is at Art Jamil and how you are encouraging or how you are understanding artists from the region and their relationship to a past, a heritage, breaking it up, questioning it, living it? Well, we're learning all the time, and I'm, I'm definitely the, the baby institution around this, uh, around this table. We've just been going for four months, so we're very young in terms of institution. And, the, and then the foundation that I work for, Art Jamil, has been working since 2004, but often in relationships with other museums in London and New York, elsewhere. So it's a kind of um, very much a process of dialogue. And it was interesting that you brought up um, this kind of idea of inheritance and a kind of traditional way of doing things. I think everyone who's uh, come from, from abroad will understand, having been here the last few days, that the UAE is incredibly focused on the possibility of the future. So we have a kind of choice, you know, what do we want to inherit? What do we choose to inherit from elsewhere? What do we choose to build from the ground up and how do we choose to do that? So I've been trying to think about this question of activating the past in our, presence, in our present from the context of living and working in the UAE and also this institution building uh, mode that we're in at the moment and very much kind of focused on a contemporary arts centre rather than a museum and that was quite a deliberate kind of choice of words. Mm -hmm. um, also, this kind of idea that we talked about uh, previously about these kind of binaries of East and West, uh, national, transnational, modern, contemporary. There's also a way in which to, uh, you know, a new institution can kind of disrupt those and maybe try to diminish their relevance or try to find ways around them and to sort of mess with them. So I guess our philosophy is not necessarily about trying to... Uh, you know, present an alternative arts history because that begs the question, you know, alternative to what? Mm -hmm. But instead to sort of think Good kind of point. from the ground up and about opening historical connections across geographies mm -hmm. and in ways that really connect with a kind of contemporary present and a contemporary lived experience when it comes to our audiences. And also just, I guess, to focus on uh, context as king or context as queen, and thinking how a, a very micro, kind of local context can broaden the conversation right mm -hmm. out. So mm -hmm. with the Jamil Arts Center, which as I said, just opened in November, we're situated on the Dubai Creek and we chose to sort of embrace that body of water as our inspiration for the collection, for the mm -hmm. programs that we do, whether they be in commissions, research, exhibition making, uh, libraries, public programs, and to really think about the ebb and flow of that body of water and how it's been a connector for the city of Dubai and for the larger kind of UAE uh, trading economy with South Asia, Iran, with the Arab world, with East Africa, and to think about mm -hmm. those kinds of connections through the context or through the medium mm -hmm. of, of water itself, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. gives this idea then of confluence mm -hmm. and enables us mm -hmm. to really think about the encounters that shape broader mm -hmm. kind of histories. Mm -hmm. um, and at the very starting point is always the artist. So to sort of think of the artist and their work, and if we can take that as the starting point, then we can build around it a kind of mode of working that is really focused on R&D, on making the institution into a kind of laboratory between this triangular relationship, the artist, the institution, and the audiences themselves. So how do we open up a program to enable those conversations to take place in each one of those kind of players in the institution building process to influence the direction of, of the museum itself? So we tend to work with uh, contemporary artists, but artists that reveal histories, that engage with them, that question them, that kind of um, unravel them, and to really 
think about that kind of working process of history making as we go along. Part of this is responding to um, the kind of uh, paucity of materials, particularly in Arabic in, in this region, that have enabled, maybe it's a blessing not to have a kind of gombrich or a kind of canon, you know, because we can kind of investigate mm -hmm. it and, and play with it as we go along. Mm -hmm. But trying to sort of really uh, look at those kind of resources. Um, a number of artists have been really instrumental in our thinking. Um, Ala Yunus is somewhere here in the audience. She spoke yesterday, an artist who, for example, we've worked with multiple times. She's also uh, part of this exhibition, Crude, uh, curated by Murtaza Vali, which just unfortunately closed, but we have catalogues if people want to come and see the catalogue. Mm -hmm. And um, that exhibition looked at the archives, histories, and contemporary realities of oil in this region and how mm -hmm. oil shaped uh, our kind of our lives in, in a really, really fundamental way, mm -hmm. but it, which is rarely kind of put out on a, on a public um, kind of a public arena for people to discuss and to unravel those ideas. So the ways that artists engage with that, some people will probably know Rayan Tarbit's work, for example, where he looked at the history of the TAP pipeline, the Trans-Arabian pipeline, um, between 1950 and 1975, and the ways in which that uh, pipeline created a particular kind of marked political moment in, in this region. Mm -hmm. uh, other artists, Manal al uh, the Saudi artist, for example, looked at the first generation of Saudis to work in Aramco and what their stories kind of told. Mm -hmm. And some of the works in, in the exhibition were really quite conceptual in, in nature. It could be seen as challenging for broad audiences. Mm -hmm. But because this history was so familiar, so mm -hmm. acutely part mm -hmm. of people's lives, we mm -hmm. found that you know, people who'd never been to museums before found a way into the work and discussed mm -hmm. this and brought out these kind of debates into, mm -hmm. the, into the fore. Um, just one other quick example would be um, an experimental research studio we have on at the moment by Rand Abul Jabba, who's an artist and practitioner from Abu Dhabi, who's been researching uh, the minaret of Anna in mm -hmm. western uh, Iraq mm -hmm. for, for a long time. And we invited her to present her research, which includes kind of home videos, photos, um, architectural drawings, kind of more deep research, and to present that and, um, in the museum. And, and by doing that, open up a conversation about the history of this minaret, which was uh, first moved when um, Anna was, uh, the lake around Anna was dammed. It was sliced up and moved to a different place. It was then um, occupied by US forces in the, in the 2000s and consequently bombed by Al-Qaeda and then rebuilt again for the second time, uh, only to be destroyed by ISIS mm. in 2016. So she tells this very sort of dramatic story, but one through the eyes of an artist with all mm. the complexity, all the kind of mm. grit and all the kind of questions that can be asked in that way and invites audiences to come in and build that history with her. So I, I thank you for that because you're reminding us that when we say the past, we can also mean the recent past and we can, we can refer to um, histories of modernism as I think many artists in this region are and what you're discussing, um, uh, political, geopolitical, as well as cultural, societal. Um, and ideological, so that that too can be a source, but it's still a source that I would argue in a strict um, Eurocentric Western context can still seem very foreign and other and uncomfortable, so that's why we like it. So Shazia, could we uh, hit the uh, PowerPoint, please? So we're just going <laughs> to, since we're talking about art, we have to look at some art. So Shazia Sikander, uh, we're going to be looking at some of her work. Uh, Shazia, you have um, spoken a lot to me over the years about the conflicts you feel of being an artist from Pakistan who was trained in the greatest art school uh, uh, and the greatest in the greatest department of miniature painting in South Asia, in Lahore, uh, and the the richness that you have derived from that training, but also the entrapment you have sometimes felt by it when you are taking this practice, this motif, this material outside. Um, can, you, can you talk about what, that, what, what your need for that, the past is, and also what your struggle with it is? Um, thank you. Um, well, I think it's important to first- Keep, keep showing it, please. Thanks to understand how definitions of tradition are assembled. So to have studied 
say, miniature painting or to have had an interest in something which was not necessarily uh, an idiom within contemporary art was also, I think, um, partly uh, a situation growing up, coming of age in during the military dictatorship. So also fueled as a young woman, um, I, I was studying mathematics, so my interest in, in understanding tradition was a curiosity about language, about learning something which was not necessarily the given platform within contemporary practice. So that, that is one aspect of it. I am a research-based artist, so when you start examining um, the provenance of objects, you do realize that a vast majority of it resides in Western institutions, storages, in things that have not necessarily been archived, so they remain pretty much invisible. And if how they have been categorized and how, what is the provenance of those objects, and I think understanding that made me realize that a lot of the things that I'm interested in as an artist are not necessarily held within the notion of the nation state. Mm -hmm. So how, um, how, do you, how, how do you create art or how do you create work that constantly defies boundaries, boundaries that are is often straight-jacketed in terms of biographies, mm -hmm. in terms of representing a specific mm -hmm. culture, mm -hmm. the burden of that representation, mm -hmm. as um, artists don't necessarily you know, create work from just within those limitations and um, representations. So mo most of the iconographies that I started to focus on were how to uh, confront the narrow definitions mm -hmm. and how to um, challenge them mm -hmm. and how to um, center the conversation around, around, around art, around the histories, mm -hmm. around uh, collaborative practices, mm -hmm. how to have, say, autonomy of the composer, the musician, um, the author, the poets within the practice mm -hmm. of, of visual art, like mm -hmm. as a painter. So, how to sort of like, you know, not hold on to certain expectations that I felt were being placed on my, on who I was, mm -hmm. but to take all of those challenges. So whether one confronted being an, a female artist, a Muslim artist, or a Asian artist, or Asian American, or Pakistani, or not Pakistani enough, all of these categories are, mm -hmm. I think, incredibly valid, mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. But for me as an artist, I often think how to create art that can exist in all these categories right. yeah. and at the same time can transcend them and yeah. remain sort of timeless. Yeah. What is, what, how do you, what is that mysterious a um, combination, amalgamation. And I think for that, it's really important to obviously have narratives, have uh, definitions that are not, uh, that their agendas are no longer about um, keeping in tie with what has already been going on in a very linear way of representation and right. more voices within art historical practices. Right, yeah, I, I want to come back if we have time to hear about your, um, if you want, if you would share it, the kind of problem you've had with the Pakistani art establishment, because I think it draws another set of problems about who represents what, uh, who claims representation. Yeah, I think the tyranny of authenticity in that respect, yes. like yeah. just that notion itself, like who, what is authentic? Right. That in, in itself is such yeah. a, a interesting and, um, and a space that needs to be understood because it's very easy and simplistic to just determine that something is, go, is represented, right. representative of a very authentic right. idea of being. You know, yeah. human identity is very mercurial. Yeah, it's exactly. constantly changing. So I, I love that word mercurial because I think my problem with a word like authenticity is that it's very fixed. It's actually very ideologically fixed. There's someone is deciding what's authentic and making you that thing, making you represent that thing. When, as you say, being an artist, being a thinker, being a curator is mercurial and life is changing all the time. 
Um, so what I'm seeking for, what we're seeking for as a curatorial model or to use, Wanda, she said, I don't like models, I like steps. <laughs> so <laughs> as a curatorial step in our museums, how can we be more mercurial? I mean, I think that's a good question. How can we seek and do our cultural responsibility? I don't put that in quotes. That is a mission for, for, for many of us um, to, to have wider, again, geography of ideas and I don't even like the word representation, but uh, uh, but not get uh, tied to this idea of authenticity. And um, so, Wanda, I, I have a I have a question for you, a kind of challenge. No. <laughs> <laughs> I have learned so much from this person. I've only <laughs> known her for like three days. She's already changed my life. But I can know you well enough already. I can challenge you. So, your as you've been talking to us about indigenous art and what it means to you as an authentic indigenous person. <laughs> uh, I don't use those words. <laughs> challenge me, challenge me. Start In right now. Indigenous, indigenous doesn't actually exist. That's just a comfortable thing that collects a whole bunch of different nations together for the convenience of colonizing societies. Okay. So. <laughs> See why I love her. Okay. <laughs> but, but I chose it as the title of my job, so <laughs> <laughs> because I'm interested in working across these nations. Um, but yeah, so I am really interested in how the specific relates to the universal. So the specificity of being Anishinaabe versus Blackfoot versus Cree versus, and probably none of you know most of these nations <laughs> that I'm saying, but, um, you know, I think that there, there, are, there are, when we look at the past, it actually doesn't exist in the past, it's just in the present. Mm -hmm. So when we go back to do research or to look at things, or to excavate, or, or the way art, like I love artists, the way they do research compared to historians. <laughs> Historians are so factual, they don't understand the future. So artists get something about the past, and that is, a as you excavate the past, it transforms as you look at it, as you examine it, as you pull it out. And all of the disruptions, all of the pains and, and, and violences and things that societies have gone through means that there are pasts that never turned into a future. So when we go backwards, mm -hmm. and, we, and it's not going backwards, it's mm -hmm. present, it's here, now. You pick up these pieces from the past, you actually create new futures that were, never came to be. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, it's a transformative mm -hmm. movement, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. It's not a, a, a line, right? you know? So we've been talking a lot in the last two days about heritage, and in the uh, amazing panel that preceded ours, uh, we, we heard a call for uh, th uh, not just building heritage in a place like Mosul uh, for its people, but how that heritage and the preservation of that heritage, be it a mosque or a church or someone's house that's been around for a thousand years, is all of our heritage. It's the heritage I keep hearing the last two days of humanity. So mm -hmm. again, I'm going to challenge you and you're going to challenge me right back. Um, in your... We could wrestle. This is a really pretty little wrestling. I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, we are wrestling. Um, <laughs> these are all our little brain, 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 brain tags. So, uh, because this is a new field for me, yeah. you're, you're teaching me. Um, in this thing that this circle is calling indigenous art, mm -hmm. what I've heard you say is that, and what I've, you know, what we know is that, that those who are, are receiving their belongings back, communities that are receiving belongings back that have been torn from them mm -hmm. wrongly through colonial exploits of all kinds, their, their use of that art, the proper function of that object might be to bury it or burn it, mm -hmm. as, as I understand it. Um, how does that, how do you reconcile that authenticity, for lack of a better word, with this call for, I want 
I want to become you. I want to learn your dance. I want to learn the prayers that you did before you went on this panel. She prayed this morning. <laughs> um, so she called her ancestors. Don't doubt me. <laughs> um, so, you know, how I want to learn. So can I learn or is the fact that I'm a white colonializing Scot? who came over in the 17th century. The Scots and weren't as bad as the British. <laughs> Thank you. I had a little English in me too. We generally um, had babies together yeah. more often. I do have Indian in my background, I'm told. <laughs> um, oh God. Uh, but uh, anyway, so, yes. so how, how do I reconcile that? I think, um, well, I've been challenged by my elders to think this through. So our culture was banned for you know, almost 150 years. Certain practices that were really essential to our governance, our political structures. For us, spirituality is tied into political power too. So that's why it, they were attacked, is because it allowed us to not have the political power to fight this incoming settlements that were happening. So I think, um, and the first thing they did was remove the power of women. But that's a whole nother discussion. They did in that my society too. <laughs> um, but anyway, there was a, um, uh, I totally lost my train of thought there because now I'm in that zone. But so, to, so that banning meant that we took things underground and we hid them. Um, and then the, you know, the government and different kinds of entertainment would trot us out to do, you know, our little dances, which is kind of what multiculturalism does today. Um, trot us out to do our little dances mm -hmm. for, um, for them when our culture was banned in its reality. So we used to do things like do it, you know, do a dance backwards or do really stereotypical movements and just love, you know, play with the desire for our authentic culture, which wasn't authentic at all. We mm. were totally messing it up on purpose. <laughs> um, and then we have this private culture, you know, and so when it became unbanned, and then you have me, like, you know, I'm old, but um, not that old. Uh, by the time you get to me, I still have this fear of showing other people this culture because mm. it's, it's been so bastardized by mm. another people. Mm -hmm. And it's been so used and mm -hmm. abused. Mm -hmm. And so in order for me to raise my son as an Anishinaabe, I mm -hmm. feel the necessity of protecting its integrity. I see. So, mm -hmm. but part of that integrity means it changes. So we can get to that, but. Yeah. Um, so I think that my elders have challenged me in the sense of pushing me to, for example, we did a water ceremony with um, non-native people of all different uh, cultures. And um, that was hard for me at first, because I thought, what am I playing into? Am I playing into these kind of Western desires of daking, daking, daking? Or, you know, am I... So what they said to me was, if they don't experience the water as a spirit through the ceremony and through the practice, then how are they ever supposed to feel the ne necessity of protecting it? Mm. So I sort of felt like, okay, fine, mm. we'll do the water ceremony, but you can't have the rest. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I always say, if you're, if you're not gonna take the politics, you can't have the spirituality. All right, thank you. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, see if, if, if uh, our yes, wonderful yes. moderator will yes. give us a few more, t a little bit more time than one minute and 47 seconds for yes, questions. A couple of questions. Uh, questions for anyone on the panel, and I'd love you guys to ask questions to each other too. Wish we'd and please address it to someone specifically. Hi, I'm uh, Hussein Abdul Hussein, originally from Lebanon, now in the U.S. I just want to ask about the, uh, I mean, w we've been talking about colonialism, but uh, to put things in perspective, it was colonialism that uh, saved the pyramids, that decoded the hieroglyphs. It was uh, the colonialism that excavated the Roman ruins in Baalbek. When everything happened in, um, in Mosul and uh, Palmyra, I was happy that uh, the British Museum Questions. actually housed uh, so many parts of, of, of this heritage. So I, I just want you know, to ask any of the panelists, 
where do we place this? I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not that colonialism was bad all the time. Where do, you, where do we place the, the positive part that colonialism uh, played in this? You know, that is a wonderful question, and I think that's a question that we might want to workshop later, because this panel is mm -hmm. not specifically on colonialism. Uh, I, and, and I don't think any one of us is, a, is a, like an academic expert. Does anyone want to answer that? I just feel that I'd like to keep to the question <laughs> of how can we activate the past in our museums. Um, and, and, and what you're saying is our museums uh, in the West, which have these objects, some of them, not all of them, I argued with Wanda about this too, some, not all, maybe the majority, but not mm. all, did come in through uh, colonial uh, acquisition, shall we say, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, a, and have been there as a basis of study for, you know, for some good. We have to admit it's for some good, but at at, an, at a cost. I think it's a fantastic thing to workshop. We will take it up in our workshop this afternoon. How about that, Wanda? Mm. <laughs> sure. Um, but is there any question that is There's specifically question about there. museum practice and the past? I, I just would like to put you guys in peace again because you are fighting these ladies. Oh, we are. Nice. <laughs> we love each other. I'm joking. We love each other. Um, it's in jest. Alex Alexandra was mentioning at the beginning that um, uh, this wonderful artist, Emeka, yesterday was um, proposing that yeah. artists do VR as we, the theme is also about technology and how it can bring the both. And um, Wanda was having this wonderful sentence about the difference between artists and historians. Um, and that artists are better researchers. And of course, we have an artist here who has been uh, uh, witnessing that. Mm. This, isn't that the place where VR can uh, link all this and get things out, bring them back to context, um, and satisfy your desire to bring you know, politics and spirituality together? That's a question. I'm actually going to turn that question to Apinan mm -hmm. because he's actually had a lot of experience working with artists in VR, and you know the medium. And do you think it can solve this? Yeah, I think um, issue. I think there are positive sides to to VR, as well as uh, positive and negative side of uh, acquiring uh, artworks during colonization, because uh, many objects of artworks, so-called artworks in the museums. Uh, are not just about authenticity, nor is it about uh, beauty, but it also reminds people of how it got there. You know, the hurt, uh, the looting, mm -hmm. the pillaging. So a lot of the times, museums don't address this. I mean, this gentleman uh, asked us about the, the British Museum acquiring the artifacts. That's fantastic. That's really good. But also, we have to consider when is the British Museum going to give back some of the objects that they've, they've kindly protected for over the centuries. <laughs> you know, I, why, why, why call Elgin... <laughs> why call Elgin marble, for goodness sake? It's, it's Greek, Greek marble, yeah. you know? Something like that should be a gesture, and this, this is when VR comes in. You know, after Brexit, you know, there's going to be a lot of empty rooms. <laughs> <laughs> We do VR for the Elgin Marbles and the Parthenon and give back <laughs> these objects to the original country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's like, give them the VR. <laughs> I'm afraid we have to wrap it up. We will be having a workshop this afternoon. I'm going to invite all our panelists to that workshop where, again, we're asked to come up with um, answers. Yesterday, we were working through questions. Today's answers and tomorrow's yeah. actions. I think we have some ideas of all three. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you Thank all you. for being here.